if you're in an environment where you don't get that support, I mean, there's so many people that are so talented that just don't get anybody saying, hey, you know what, you're good enough. Or if it is, it's somebody who they don't respect. They they might res- admire, but their opinion doesn't really matter. It's just like, well, you know, my dad telling me I'm good is not right. the same as this established musician. Right. Or your girlfriend, you know? yeah. right? And so I didn't get a lot of support from uh, from friends and family initially because they didn't really understand what I was doing. I just they didn't see the progression of me going from theater to music. They saw me theater, and then they were just wondering when I was gonna like grow out of that it's and, like a stage. and do something real right yeah, yeah. and then when i told them yeah i'm gonna go to austin and be a singer they're like what <laughs> you're gonna what now well welcome back to the songwriter snack time podcast and today we are joined by donovan keith man thank you for coming down and spending some time with us man. dude thanks for having me this is awesome i caught the uh a previous couple of podcasts and just kind of randomly stumbled upon the podcast and it looks really fun and cool. You know, so. it's super encouraging to me. It's because my son, he's 11, he's a jokester, but he mentioned last night, he's like, oh, so you do have a single fan of your podcast. And it's like, <laughs> I, at some level, it is cool to know that like you put something out into the world, you know, not knowing who it will connect with. And then, you know, people right. do listen. Yeah. I forget that people listen, <laughs> man. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want people to um, to hear your story a little bit um, and to talk about you as a musician and also as a songwriter because your genre, your your specific sound is very different than everybody that I've talked to on this podcast, and I love it. Okay, good. So just know that. <laughs> that's where we're going. Yeah. Um, first, what I want to get into is your obsession with dark chocolate. Yes. Has it been a problem for you for a while? Uh, within the last year. So I'd say it's probably something that was, uh, made worse by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, uh, yes, today we have, uh, 86% intense dark chocolate and, um, we are midnight reverie or whatever it's called. Yeah. You know, there's different, uh, I was mentioning earlier that there's different percentages. Right. So, um, I definitely know that dark chocolate is, a supposed to be is it they say it's supposed to be good for you but oh yeah, um, yeah. it's actually super nutritious too and then uh want a bar yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course and i eat a lot of different brands um but you know girardelli and lint like they're the most common that you can find but mm. if i can find european chocolate i'll eat that and i haven't had breakfast yet this is perfect oh, perfect <laughs> perfect man <laughs> you moved um now you live in austin um but where did you grow up and the the easiest thing that i like to ask people is where did it all start in regards to when did music first kind of have an impact on you and kind of impact your life (laughs) okay well i was um when i was a little kid uh, i was two major influences one believe it or not was sesame street Cool. And I used to watch a lot, of, a lot of the old, uh, the old '70s and early '80s reruns of Sesame Street. So you'd have like the little music specials with like Stevie Wonder or Little Richard, or somebody would come on and do like yeah. a music thing. And then there was also this little puppet. Uh, it wasn't a very common one. He was kind of one of the side guys you only see randomly. But his name was Little Chrissy. He was a blue puppet with yellow hair okay. and and like John Lennon glasses. But the guys, the the guy who did the voice for him was actually a pretty good like singer. And he played piano, and so he would. They would write for him like parodies of like oldies songs, like early rock and roll hits. Yeah. With whatever was like the alphabet, or you know, you're alive, and uh, yeah. So <laughs> and it, it was awesome. But the the guy's voice was so good. So that was an early influence. Believe it or not, it's like four or five, six years old. And then the other one was that uh, my parents raised me on older music, so. Anything that came on the oldie station back then, from mm. like Sam Cooke to Beach Boys and Beatles and Otis Redding, everybody in between. Yeah, and that was what I was listening to all day, every day for I don't know any you know the the first years of memory. So mm. your ages three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up till probably I, actually I never really stopped. Uh, but I grew up in the St. Louis area, and there was Clue One Hundred Three was the old oldie station that's no longer active. Um, and that was the one I, I grew up on. I heard all my stuff. So the influences yeah. are those two things. That's funny. <laughs> but the Sesame Street, I don't discount that because that was a really <laughs> important one. 
Yeah. What about your parents? I mean, they they obviously loved that music too. Were they musicians, singers? Like, where did it? No, they were just music fans. My uh, my parents uh, were big fans of Donovan Leach, the the singer, songwriter, hmm. and uh, named me after him. Yeah. And uh, he's got a lot of weird music, though. I gotta be honest. He's got some cool mm. songs and hits, but I he's don't know that name, he's yeah. way more abstract. He did like Mellow Yellow, uh, Sunshine Superman, and um, I mean, really hippie, really hippie for that like the '60s. And um, yeah, my dad, my my dad, my mom, they, my parents weren't hippies, but they were uh, had a very ecle- eclectic music taste. When do you first remember like trying to sing and just being like? Oh, let me try. That. <laughs> let me try to sing along. Going back to the Sesame Street, I actually have an audio. I still have the tape of me uh, recording on an old. This is like cassette tapes mm-hmm. on a stereo, where you could press the two buttons down and you could record on any type of tape. I have a recording of me trying to sing one of his songs when I'm six years old. Wow! And I was like doing this radio show, and my voice is all high. Hi, I'm Donovan, and this is my show. And I couldn't play piano at all. I was just slamming my hands down on one of those. Like a toy version of this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With like the one of 14 keys or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> that is But funny. Uh, that was the first iteration of that. Yeah. But uh, as time wore on, um, I could actually, I was pretty decent in music class as a kid. And and singing was okay. And then my voice changed. And <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, then yeah. I was embarrassed for my voice for several years. Totally. And then in high school, I guess I was kind of a late bloomer. Hmm. I never, I was a theater kid, but I, we never did any... I never did any musical theater, and I was basically just emulating those singers on the oldie stations. Uh, the all a bunch of different people. I would just sing along to them, mm-hmm. but I would I was always afraid if somebody was listening. It was mm. just me singing along to them, and that was all I was That's comfortable it. with. Yeah. And then somewhere in high school, I had an ex girlfriend. Uh, she happened to catch me when I unaware that she was there, and. Uh, <laughs> You know how it is. You know, the girlfriend's like, oh, it's nice. You shouldn't do that more often. I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. You're just but saying that. It yeah. eventually turned into a little bit more. And, uh, yeah, I started I started singing more in, like, uh, karaoke and, like, talent nights and things like that as high school and college went on and just kind of gained in confidence, I suppose. Yeah. Well, confidence, I think, uh, especially watching your live stuff that you put on YouTube, it's like, it feels like, dude, you just – or owning the stage like that must have been a process right of like going from kind of like i don't want anybody to, to hear me sing to like let me just jam right in front of you like well i had i've never had because i guess from theater like i never had a problem being goofy and and active and jumping around so i was always a bit of a performer but i was like if i was going to do theater like in high school and i actually went to college as a theater major you know mine was like i i do theater mm. i don't do musicals you know <laughs> Yeah, it's not that I don't like musicals. I just thought musicals were always kind of tacky and didn't really face the like the real drama of the of the, like the theater world. Mm-hmm. Well, what brought you to Texas? Um, was that music related or job related or just music related? I was messing around with theater, uh, kind of fell out of love with that, and I still miss it. I used to do comedy and improv. I had a public access TV show I ran for a couple of years with some friends, and we was just goofed around. Mm. Uh, but you know we weren't getting any younger. <laughs> this was like college, post college, and um, everybody kind of went their separate ways. And I had a stronger pull, so there's a transition as I was kind of fading out of theater and realizing this is not what I want to do for a career. Mm-hmm. At the same time that was happening, I was I had a job at a bar. Where I was a karaoke jockey for a couple of years, and then people were like tipping me money to sing more songs instead oh, wow. of having other guys <laughs> sing. Yeah, I was like okay, and then. I got hired for like a golf outing just to sing karaoke tunes and like, what's the Adam Sandler movie? The uh, the Wedding Singer. Yeah, totally. It's a bit like that. <laughs> I was just doing karaoke style soon, uh, tunes. And then I won a contest. I beat like 50 other people out. It was a, one of those ra- local radio station karaoke you know, contests. Mm-hmm. And I won that and it was a $1,000 contest. I'm like, all right, hey. I'm already making more money doing this than I ever did with theater. <laughs> and I'm not even that great. So I'm like, maybe there's something to this. So uh, it's actually a crazy story. There's a uh, my, of a blues singing mentor. His name is Earl Thomas. Lives in uh, California, and I think he's retired now. He just recently retired. But when he used to be on a 
Blues International record label in Memphis, and he released a couple of contemporary albums. I came across his music online on like eMusic or one of the down- download sites, mm-hmm. and I heard some songs on there that kind of reminded me of like old classic soul music, even though it was more contemporary blues. But I liked his voice, I liked his songs, and he. This was when MySpace was at the near end, but musically, it was like everyone had a music MySpace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I reached out. I just sent him a random message, when, one of those nights of desperation where I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Hmm. And uh, I was like, hey, man, I have this music MySpace page. Can you just check it out and tell me if I suck? You know, I have thick skin. It's totally fine. I'm thinking about being a singer, but I don't know. And uh, Was that your own music that you had up or just It was just me singing karaoke songs. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he just like, I didn't hear back from a couple months. And finally I heard back and he's like, dude, you have a really good voice. It's really raw. You need coaching, but um, you should start doing that. Like, do you write your own songs? And I was like, yeah. But that's that was BS. I mean, the only songs I had written to that point were in the comedy shows or the theater shows. I'd written like parodied songs, and that was it. That was the limit of my songwriting ability. But this guy's music that I'd listened to all summer actually replies. <laughs> He's like, yeah. hey, do you write your own songs? I'm like, yeah. Of course, I can do it. <laughs> so I got up the next day. I wrote like three songs. I just pulled karaoke tracks that nobody would recognize and then wrote different lyrics. In one it. day, just wrote three right. songs? Right, yeah. yeah. And I just uh, wrote a new lyrical me- melody and lyrics to the songs. And two of them were kind of me. But one of them stuck out and resonated with him. And he's like, dude, these are awesome. And I'm like, what? (laughs) So this established blues artist who's made multiple albums and uh, traveled a bunch in Europe and played Montreux Jazz Festival and all that stuff, he's telling me that I'm, you know, whatever I I wrote in a day, he's like, yeah, this is really good. And it was horrible. It was like karaoke backtracks, me singing on a Logitech desktop microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible. (laughs) Horrible. Um, and I, I cringe when I go back and listen to that now, and I was like, what did he see in that performance? Or I wanted to hear in it. But uh, yeah, so he's the one that kind of set me down this path because when you grow up in the Midwest in a small town like I did, you don't have a lot of people there who, oh, yeah, you can make it. You know, go follow your mm-hmm. dreams. They say that, but in reality, it's kind of like, what? what? You're yeah, going to be a like, singer yeah. because – Small towns in the Midwest and or wherever you're at, small towns don't have people that were successful generally. Mm-hmm. There are people who are like they stayed in town or maybe they went and failed somewhere and they came back. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to like really big high aspirations, and so or the people raising families and stuff like that, it's totally fine. Did you ever did you struggle with that idea of believing that you could succeed? Oh yeah. yeah. And if you don't, if you're in an environment where you don't get that support, I mean, there's so many people that are so talented that just don't get anybody saying, hey, you know what, you're good enough. Or if it is, it's somebody who they don't respect. They they might res- admire, but their opinion doesn't really matter. It's mm-hmm. just like, well, mm-hmm. you know, my dad telling me I'm good is right. not the same as this established musician. Right. Or your girlfriend. You know? yeah. Right. And so I didn't get a lot of support from, uh, from friends and family initially mm-hmm. because they didn't really understand what I was doing. I just, they didn't see the progression of me going from theater to music. They saw me theater and then they were just wondering when I was going to like grow out of that it's and, like a stage. and do something real right yeah, yeah. and then when I told them yeah I'm going to go to Austin and be a singer they're like what <laughs> you're going to what now uh, anyway how yeah. long ago was that that was uh, a little over 10 years 11 years ago take us through the Austin scene real quick because you get there 10 years ago and it's obviously an amazing music city um did you start to gather guys around you and start to like write more songs or like how did that process go? Like, as it, are you actually you sing, but are you also a musician and do you play keys or play that's guitar the funny thing? So I decided to be a singer um, without ever, never playing music, never playing an instrument, uh, never taking any formal music lessons, never been in a band before, <laughs> never written any songs outside of the ones I wrote for this guy. Everything against you there. Which is super strange. But the thing is, mentally, I had the image of mm. what I wanted it to sound like, what I wanted it to look like, what I wanted the performance to be. Yeah. Uh, because I've always been a very visual, like physical performer. I'm like, if I can do that, then I'll just find a way to make that happen. And it took a long time. Mm. But um, yeah, once you have that vision in your mind, then you can make it happen. So... Uh, all I needed was one established artist who I didn't know. It's so funny. And he's just like, yeah, man, you're good enough. Go. You don't want to go to New York, L.A., Chicago. It's too expensive to live there. And you'll just get swallowed up by all the professional high-level talent. You need to go somewhere you can cut your teeth and grow. 
he mentioned a bunch of towns. He mentioned Austin. I'm like, Austin? What's hmm. in Austin? When you grow up in the Midwest, like Texas doesn't exist. It's just like, there's nothing down there. <laughs> Everything, Chicago is the center of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, when, I guess it's true for the region. But then sure. when I started to read more about it, and I wanted to get away from the, the winter, like cold weather, man. Oh, I am, God, oh, it was getting to you. <laughs> oh, it's awful growing up, and I don't miss it at all. So I was like, Austin sounds pretty cool. Texas sounds pretty cool. It totally worked out. I saved up five grand in like nine months, moved on a whim, not knowing anybody. Hmm. And but the the mentor, uh, you know, Earl's been the one that really helped me along the way. So anytime I was, I got the to town. Uh, any pitfalls avoiding how to put the band together and where to find the guys. And at that time, Craigslist was kind of, I don't know, height of its popularity. Mm-hmm. So there were a ton of musicians in Austin. I mean, it'd be like every day, three or four pages full of people looking wow. for bands, putting together bands. So that was easier back then. Um, and that's, yeah, I actually put the first band together on Craigslist within a couple of months to move to Austin. Uh, had a first <laughs> gig at a bar in like Sp- way out in Spicewood in this small town at a place that's no longer uh, open. Was it a combination of like entertainment type music and then maybe you'd slip a, an original song in every once in a while or like from the get mm. where you're like, I just want to do my thing? Yeah, so I, it was a mix because we had to pad. Obviously, all the shows, a lot of the shows we played ended up being like two one-hour sets or something. So we just mm-hmm. filled it with soul covers that I personally liked that I knew. Yeah. Uh, some are well-known, some are more obscure. And then I mixed in... Some of the newer tunes that I was writing, and I needed a lot of help. So back then, I didn't really know what I was doing, and it was useful to have the uh, musicians to kind of fill in the gaps and be able to communicate with the other musicians. I had no idea what I was talking about. People, yeah. Like, yeah, music theory and all that stuff. <laughs> like, like what's what keys the song in, what the chord progression is, mm-hmm. you know, how to embellish a certain part. Uh, the timing of the drum beats and stuff like that. I would just be like, dot, dot, no, 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 it goes dot, 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 or, or it goes, you know, da, 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 da. That's all I had. That's all I had. And uh, somehow I made it work. I love that though, like, because a lot of times, I mean, even it works with me the same way as I'm producing records. It's like, what do you hear here? Like, oh, I want something. It's like, if if you can really figure out like what they have in their brain, that's that's what you're trying to figure out. And it seems like you, even from the beginning, always kind of had this very clear vision of kind of what you wanted your sound to be and where you you could be. Um, so I think that's, and, and probably, like, tell me if you feel this way, but, like, um, you released a four-song project. Um, is, is that, like, how long ago did you release that? Oh, well, so the... You know, um, the four-song... Um, so... Uh... Yeah, that's kind of it's kind of a weird thing. So the album is actually due in April, and I've been releasing singles every month. But for some reason, and I don't mm. know why, uh, I've been doing the the little thing on TuneCore where you, instead of uploading it as a single, you upload it as an album each time. Okay. Um, and there's a, a whole concept behind it, but uh, it doesn't always when you're putting it on the distributors like with TuneCore and stuff, they don't always. Um, like something like, oh, this is the new single. And then the next time you release an album, it'll be like a full album. And then the next time it'll say it's an EP or whatever. Mm. So the four songs that come up are the basically the compilation of the four singles that have been released so oh. far. And so there's going to be more to- right every month up until uh, April 2022. And then I'm going to release a full album. But That's yes, really cool. so it doesn't really have uh, okay. a, a title or anything. It's just the four mm-hmm. songs that I've released so far. Well, talk about your songwriting process a little bit. Like, how does it work um, maybe with... Do the current guys help you with ideas that you put together, or is it like, like how do where did where did the inspiration for your songs come from, and then how do they come about? Well, the songwriting process has um, changed over the years. The first band that I had uh, was a band called Soul Track Mind, and that one, I mean, I needed a lot of help figuring songs out. So I would bring a r- really rough idea. And uh, I could kind of noodle on a guitar. I wasn't really common. I actually wrote some songs on a bass guitar. Mm, Or at least I started with the bass rhythm. And then I wrote like a a guitar line or a horn line on the bass and just said, hey, play this. And, you know. (laughs) And gradually that changed. Um, Once I I taught uh, voice lessons at a school in Austin for a few years. And uh, I picked up piano just doing the lessons with the kids. Cool. So after I picked up piano, I was like, oh, my God. I can actually communicate my ideas <laughs> totally. fully. Uh, and so then it changed. And um, But I've always been a guy who 
like you know mentally I had uh, an image or maybe some just something in my ear of like how mm-hmm. I wanted a certain song to go and I'm always boom 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 mm-hmm. and doing the voice on uh, voice messages on the phone and recording ideas so then when you hear it you're like that's it right like, that's, that's and I'll you're... yeah or I'll just embellish a certain melody and then you know I have something I'll just put a simple beat to it and uh, just play it over and over and over again until I get something solid sometimes lyrics just come an entire lyrical melody of a verse and a chorus will come with no other instrumentation whatsoever Mm -hmm. and then other times it's very instrument guided and then i have to write the lyrics later which is way more difficult but that Mm. seems to happen more often are you super critical with yourself I, i so many guys tell me like you know you know we're working on four songs or whatever and he's like well there's 50 that you that weren't even worthy oh, yeah. to be in the studio. Do you kind of operate the same way where you just like, is there a freedom to create and then just like, you know, be, su- be critical afterwards on what you like and what you don't like? Man, I need to, I think take a lesson in that. <laughs> I think there've been songs that I've recorded maybe 10 times and still haven't released. Oh. And it's not necessarily because the idea itself is bad. It's because that the, uh, it's really difficult to get the song I have in my head mm-hmm. totally out and mm-hmm. or as close to that idea as I possibly could. Mm-hmm. Uh, or sometimes I get surprised by what comes out, and I like that more, but that's rare. Mm-hmm. It's usually like I've got that idea, and I want to make that idea happen uh, how it sounds in my head. And a lot of times we'll record it, and it just doesn't translate. Mm-hmm. Uh, either just like musicians don't play it quite right or – uh, it just meanders into someone else's idea or something, and I'm like, I, I can't release that. And it's really it, – that song could actually be good for some people. Like some people would still like it, but I'm yeah. like, ugh. It has to get to a mind. place where you are you are happy with it, right? right. Like, And you're just like satisfied with it. And I think for your genre, kind of soul, funk, jam, like I'm thinking in my mind, like the first thing when I was listening to your music was that came to mind was Mark Broussard. Mm-hmm. Live, like I remember seeing him live and just being blown away, and just be like the energy and just the funkiness and all this. The bass player with Calvin Turner was amazing, like all this yeah. kind of stuff. But there's a fine line between like let's jam all night into let's make songs that relate to people and are emotional that connect emotionally, and yeah. and and people will come back to and listen to. You know what I mean? So like, um, I feel and I feel like if you listen to um. What's the what um, low down or down low was the song that you came out yeah, with? Yeah, the one that kind of had a message to it, and it was like that to me felt like a good example of a song that jammed and was super fun to listen to, and I'll go back and listen to it to it again. But it's like also had a lyrical sh- strength there. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it can go. There, there's, I think. Do you struggle with that? Of like, hey, let's let's just make an amazing, enter- entertaining type sound but then also trying to trying to put uh, meaning in there or significance into the writing and yeah. the lyrics and the story and all that kind of stuff man you know I mean? as, as much as i wish i could just write a bunch of rap songs about booty shaking and make a lot of money <laughs> i just can't do it my connection to music was always very emotional i had a strong emotional connection i think it comes from listening to older era music so especially mm-hmm. classic mm-hmm. soul classic soul was the genre to me that like I don't know. Emotionally, it just always grabbed me. And when I decided I was going to be a singer, I'm like, that's the music. If I'm going to sing anything, it's going to be that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that song, a lot of those songs have dual meanings or they just have, uh, it's all gospel and blues based. And so there's just, but it's a very uplifting feeling to it. So it Mm -hmm. basically takes the rhythm section that you would have in blues or a rock and roll band and it adds horns to it. But it, it's a very specific way that everything is kind of arranged and played. But it's all very vocal driven and very emotionally driven, and so that's the background that I kind of approach songwriting. Mm-hmm. And that the songs that I'm going to be writing need to have some type of emotional connection for me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be sad or angry or whatever, but they, it needs to come from a, a place that's that has emotion because yeah. that's what I feel like my performance is I'm selling emotion. As a songwriter, you're, you're selling emotion. That's the, uh, uh, the guide of, I live by. Is songwriting and music for you um, discipline-related or is it inspiration, you know, like waiting for the inspiration to hit and then you go with those 
you know, those, those times of energy or are you like, no, I need to be disciplined about this? I lack discipline. Or is that the Arnold, you lack discipline, <laughs> the Arnold quote. Uh, yes. It's very inspirational based at the moment. I'm trying my best. It's almost like you recognize that there could be a, a, a growth in the discipline area. Oh, yeah. Just writing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think it's actually one of the reasons why it's taken me so long to get full albums out or mm-hmm. why it's taken me longer to get to where I am and, and where I want to be um, because of the that. Yeah. And it's not, I think it's just something I was used to because, you know, growing up, I was a, you know, um, I was the baby of the family, had three older brothers, but I was farther, you know, I was born super, super late. Um, and so I kind of, bit that distance kind of made me very independent. Mm-hmm. And I think it's kind of in, you know, what, it, what whatever I was doing in, in school, where there's like, I didn't have the discipline, even though I was a really good student, I didn't have the discipline to really strive for really good grades. I was just kind of a, eh, I was a B average, and then I played around. Like, I went and go played sports and, mm-hmm. you know, was social. And but I could have been, it had to have been more disciplined. And then I played, like, baseball and soccer and probably could have been really good at those if I had been disciplined in practice. But I was like, eh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to practice, <laughs> you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. So inevitably, if those things aren't checked, like young, you know, in your young years, later on they kind of bite you. If nobody says, hey, you need to work through this and find Because then after the fact, you know, after I stopped playing for five, six, seven years, I ended up falling in love with the games again and like mm. wishing I had kept playing because after five or six years of development, like you're already behind everybody, oh, like yeah. way behind. Yeah. So, um, yeah, with music, I feel like I had I been more disciplined when I started, I'd be a little bit further along in like the quality of the songwriting, things like that now. So I feel like anybody out there who's struggling with discipline, it's like, Yes, it's difficult, but it's the best thing for you. <laughs> Just totally. you, you got to do it. What would be to you, um, you know, and this, this people have different answers for this, but what would be success for you as a as an artist? Are you there yet? What's 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 success look like for you? Yeah, I think that's changed over the years. When I started, it was kind of a rose colored glasses sort of thing, but then slowly as time went on, I realized the genre I was playing. I think in my mind, I was like, man, it'd be really cool if everybody would like this music. Mm. And then as time went on, you just realize that you get further and further away from that era that anybody even remembers. Yeah. And now you're just kind of, I don't know, I, I feel like very niche, you know, and totally. kind of already novelty. Just playing in a band with like real instruments mm-hmm. is novelty now. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know. <laughs> you know yeah. The amount of times I've gone into a, a, a venue and the sound guy's like, oh, so you're actually using like real drums. Okay. <laughs> and you okay. have horns? Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, usually I'm just setting up uh, DJs and you know EDMs and stuff like that. Or yeah. just about every artist has some kind of loops in their uh, in their live performance now. Mm-hmm. And so just because I wasn't raised on it, you know, I yeah. experimented here and there. But I feel know. like that's such a uh, a strength though in regards to like finding and narrowing down your sound until you get to like, no, this is me, and I know. And, and tell me if you resonate with this, but like you know that like this specific sound is not going to necessarily appeal to the masses. But what's cool about that is like you really don't need a mass of, you know, a million people right. to love your music in order to be successful. You know, you really True. just need people that are hardcore fans. Right. You know? And I think with your type of music, and, and maybe you already have some or whatever, but like you can ha- find people like that that are like obsessed with your sound. Right. And your energy and your songwriting. You know what I mean? That's what I would look for. I mean, uh, back then I was, you know, rose colored glasses. I'm like, I want to play the Super Bowl. That's going to be my, you know, that would be because that was just such a lofty goal that like anybody who plays the Super Bowl had to accomplish like all of this stuff beforehand. Yeah. So that was a good lofty goal I had. But now, I mean, I would, I would settle for that. I would settle for a, uh, really intelligent crowd that kind of knows and understands the music that I'm that I'm playing, and you know, it would be nice if just American music culture and the business uh, appreciated a wider variety of music and mm. allowed for that in the space. But it since it doesn't, it's kind of you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you're a what's well, like being a mom and pop uh, antique shop, you know, mm. in a city full of WalMarts. Mm-hmm. You know, that's kind of what it feels like. Yeah. 
Do you ever get? Do you struggle with discouragement in that area, or do you just like I'm gonna do my thing and just keep I moving think forward? The only discouragement is that I'm I'm discouraged by the culture in in America, especially now that I've gotten to travel a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm discouraged by the culture in America that's just so uh, for profit music driven. So it's all big big label business and music, and so. I don't have an issue with the popular genres. If it's like top 40 pop or the country uh, hybrid Nashville country or EDM or Mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with those genres. The only issue I have is that that's the only thing that a lot of people are being spoon fed. So it's the the market share that bothers me Mm -hmm. um, just because you have entire generations of people who grow up and they don't even really know music really because they've just been spoon fed junk. Totally. And mm-hmm. it homogenizes. It's very homogenous. The the reference I look at is if you look at a top 100 Billboard chart from like 1970, mm-hmm. the variety of the music from artists, the tone, like the vo- vocal tone, male, female, black, white, Latino, um, the variance in all of the styles in the top 100. It's mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. And you'd have soul, you'd have rock, you'd have... Uh, you know, salsa. You'd have uh, singer songwriter Anne Murray type, you know, music, Carol King or something, and you had a lot of artists that didn't sound like each other either, because you had your Stevie Nicks and uh, you know, uh, like Ray Charles and you know, random just iconic voices. But I don't feel like because everybody's listening to the homogenized music. Mm. Now that the generations are coming up behind you, that's what's normal to them. So I'll be right. submitting songs to like playlists, and I'll have some of these young curators who don't. You can tell that they haven't really listened yeah. to like a lot of uh, diverse music from, from past eras, and so they'll give feedback that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know about how the drums are mixed or how the how yeah. the song is mixed. I'm like, these are top level professional guys who are mixing this song. The, yeah, we yeah. did this on purpose, so it's just like maybe you're just not used to hearing uh, real instruments or something. I yeah. don't know. So success would just be, oh, man, finding an audience and and people who appreciate something like genuine. Mm-hmm. That's all. And I feel like there's a there's an imitation kind of cheapness to a lot of the music being produced now that it's not honest. It's, it doesn't have that heart and it's not emotional. It's mostly like surface level, like the, the booty shaking music, which totally. is just, you know, it's like how many, we're going to make 25 years of the same superhero movies. And it's kind of the same thing <laughs> where we're going to make 20 years of just booty shaking songs and every generation is going to fall for it. Yeah. And so what well, are you going to do, man? <laughs> push up against that, man. Keep yeah. doing your thing. I will. I want to ask you one more question because um, as a producer, I don't get to play as much as I used to. Bass Why guitars. don't you get to play? Well, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I have a family and I'm just producing so many records that it's just like I struggle when guys, I mean, I would like to play more. You got to have your sandbox, man. You got to be allowed to when play. When I out do there. get to play, man, like there's bass guitar is my main instrument. And it's just like, it's just, it, I just, re- I forget how awesome that is. You know what I mean? It's like a drug. That, so I kind of feel and I sense that there's a certain energy when you perform. Where does that come from? And like, tell me about the energy that you are trying to go for when you are on stage and you're performing and you're entertaining. Like, yeah. Where does that come from? And like, where do you think that that, I know it probably is related to your drama background and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff, but do you feel the same kind of thing as like when you're performing? It's just this energy that just is like, Addicting, yeah. So, so it's a couple different sources. Uh, I was a big fan of Chris Farley growing up, I love that guy. And uh, there's a really good album by that Sam Cooke did, it's a live album. It's one of the things that kind of really initially caught me on to classic soul music in general. And it was a live at the Harlem Square Club, is the name of it. And if you listen to most of Sam Cooke's stuff, a studio album, it's very crossover uh and um very subdued kind of slower songs and on the live album it's he was in a transition just this like a year before he died he was in a transition to get a little bit more rougher and have more of that Mm -hmm. gospel influence that he grew up with involved in his show because that was what little richard and a couple people were doing at the time and he's like i really like that 
And so the the songs and the are a little bit faster, up tempo, and he's super raw in his voice. So normally he's a very smooth crooning Nat King Cole kind of guy, but he got super rough on that album, and that's the one that struck a chord with me. And I was like, holy crap! Just listening to the like the sheer power and the emotion that's coming through in the vocals, and then combine that with like Otis Redding and I wouldn't say James Brown. A lot of people say James Brown, but I mean, not. He wasn't as big an influence as the other guys, mm -hmm. but I think people just like, of all the people who have a huge stage performance, like yeah. people think of James Brown or like right, Mick right, Jagger right. or something like that. Right, right, right. And so, yeah, the theater background was some of it, but it wasn't really until I started getting out and playing regular with my band that I just started moving like naturally to the music they were playing. And it was just like this excitement of this genre, this style of music that it was like just kind of moving through me. And I just combined that with the other elements of that emotional performance and just trying to convey what, you know, I, all these, uh, through osmosis, I guess, yeah. of all these uh, influences. Let's move into a segment where it's just rapid question, rapid fire questions. Okay. So, <laughs> favorite concert that you've ever, ever been to? It's got to be Bobby Womack. So, when we went, uh, my band went out on a tour a couple of years ago, a very short tour, you know, and we played in L.A., and it just so happened that a fan of ours in Austin knew the guitar player in Bobby Womack's band. And I had listened to Bobby Womack for years because he was influenced by Sam Cooke and like all these things. And um, yeah, so underrated of a soul artist. I mean, probably one of the most underrated mm. and um, so good. Um, so he was, uh, this was like nine months before he passed, actually. Wow. And he was, uh, says the guitarist's name was Nate LaPointe. He's such a cool guy. Hmm. He was playing in his band regular for a couple of years. And it was, they just happened to be playing in Houston. He hits me up uh, like months after we had played in California when I met him. And he's like, hey, man, do you want a free ticket to the show? And I was like, yeah. yeah. So I went out and uh, got to hang out with the band and him. And then I got to be basically like backstage during their little arena performance or whatever. And it was awesome just seeing, he was super brittle. Of course, yeah. had to be helped up and down the stairs of the stage, but um, you could tell it was kind of like we're That's getting amazing. close to the end. He didn't; he hardly played any guitar. Mm. Uh, he mostly just sang. But I need to check that guy out. Oh man, it was so cool! It was so cool to, like, if you grow up reading about historical places in Europe, mm. you know, medieval history and all that stuff, and buildings that are a thousand years old. It, it's one thing to read about; it's another thing to just go there and touch it. You know, like sure. some Roman tower from the first century, and you're like. Wow. Yeah. So that, to see him in person. That's like, exactly Ooh. what it's like, listening to that music and really getting into that genre and that style. And then you're mm. seeing one of the guys before they pass. And unfortunately, I mm. didn't get to see a lot of those guys because they had already died young. Like Marvin Gaye died young. Sam Cooke died young. Otis Redding died young. And uh, I wasn't one of those people who had the money all the time to just run out sure. and see the Rolling Stones or right, Aretha right, right, Franklin right, right. or B.B. King anytime they were in town. Yeah. So unfortunately... I didn't get out to well, see Well, even from that shows. proximity, too, because, like, nowadays, it's, like, people you like, you know, you got to go to these big arenas, and you, you can't experience that closeness. That Like, some of the best concerts I've ever been to in Dallas were, like, these bars that you just go to, and the band is right there in front of you, and just jamming. It's, like, that yeah. kind of experience is... I need to I need to find a show like that. Yeah, basically. well, same kind of thing when, when Stevie Wonder came to ACL. It was, like, okay, well, it's Stevie Wonder, but... I'm, you know, way, 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 yeah, way back, and it's, it's kind of like, eh. It's, just different. it's different than being on stage and having him, like, literally meeting his uh, niece or something is one of the backup singers, and, like, having the, him mm. literally just, like, walking past me and still, you know, with the ladies after the show. <laughs> the the <laughs> girls curious. that have walked up, I'm like, hey, Bobby, can we get a photo? <laughs> Whatever. It's like, man, he's still got it, yeah. even at, like, 78. Okay, what's a we're gonna kind of narrow down here. What's a artist or band you currently can't stop listening to? I'd say one of uh, there's a um, R and B singer out of New York City. Her name's Emily King. I'm a huge fan. Um, she's probably I kind of go on and on about her to a lot of hmm. uh, friends or whatever, but uh, I don't really like like every single song that she does. Because yeah. it's not it's like genre, it's not really my my particular style or genre. But what I appreciate so much about her uh, is that she doesn't sound like anybody else. Nobody sounds like her. She doesn't try to copy anybody. And I think her parents are like longtime New York City based, like jazz mm. and like uh, 
theater singers or something. And so it's it kind of run her family. Her brother's like a really famous tap dancer. And, um, but her, her music is uh, just genuine and pure. Yeah. So there's a lot of artists that I'll go and see or I'll listen to their music and I'm just kind of like, yeah. Mm. You can kind of hear them just like trying to be approved and, and trying mm. to be popular or just like catering to an audience instead of just, just be yourself, just play your music. Mm. And so that is one artist that I listen to and I'm like, I believe her. No matter what she puts totally. out, and it's hard to lyric like, content's great. It's hard to like figure that out tangibly, but like, yeah, when you hear something, you, there's just a, like a, a, you get a sense of mm -hmm. like, I believe it or I don't believe it. Right. You know, and it's kind of hard to explain it one way or the other, but yeah. what's a album that everyone needs to go listen to? It doesn't have to be current, but. Hmm. Other than the live at the Hellam Square Club. <laughs> oh, man. Like we're modern or old or. Yeah, it could be whatever. Man, if they don't hear this album, they might be missing out on something. Man, I I guess I gotta plug my own, okay. don't I? Because uh, do it. I, it's not even done yet. <laughs> How many are I've there? Got total? So, There's I've four got so. out right now. But what are you going to? Ten? Uh, Twelve? Maybe okay. thirteen, fourteen? Eventually, I want to do vinyl. They're not all yeah, gonna okay. fit, but I'll try to fit as many as I can on the vinyl. Um, but the thing I'm excited about this this particular album coming out is that it's the first time that I've ever, you know, you know it's like 11, 12 years on now, that I've created a, an actual cohesive album of songs that I'm like, this is exactly how I want them to sound. Mm -hmm. So the singles that came out, like Down Low, First Time, Keep It Life Funky, like those are the songs that they came out the way I like them, like in both energy and... Mm. Um, like sonically and arrangements, because a problem we always had was uh, the live energy of the live performance yeah. was huge, and then the studio recording was mm, yes. really soft. Yeah. And people were like, eh, I like the music, but the studio music wasn't grabbing anybody. And so now I feel like I wanted the energy to be really big and kind of rough, and so the mixes yeah. are dirty, and it's on purpose. So I'll Love get it. feedback that's like, I don't know why it's mixed like that. And it was like, it's... Artistic Perfect. expression. That's exactly as a <laughs> as a mixed guy. Like when I heard, it, I was like, I I know that this was intentional. Right, you just to I mean? match the energy of the live show, uh, live yeah. show, and have the rawness of whatever we're trying to convey in the song. I like the way that um, that they treated your vocal. Right. It's, yeah. It's got like this um, saturation and just different. It's got a really good energy to it. Yeah, we've got some secret sauce there. There you go. Um, what's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Hmm. Well, probably the biggest two hobbies are swing dancing and soccer. I play soccer. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've been doing that for a few years. Drink of choice? Are we talking yeah, anything. alcohol, non alcohol? Yeah, but both. All right. Well, if it's sweet just tea? daily, it's sweet tea. Uh, and uh, I lost like 20 pounds over the last, uh, over the pandemic. I gained weight at the beginning of the pandemic, like everybody. In a depressed state, <laughs> and then I got my nutrition in order. Dark chocolate was a part of yeah. it, and sweet tea. I'm a huge fan of sweet tea, but I had to I had to cut back uh, because of the weight loss. So I uh, try to do stevia when I can. It's you know it's not quite the same. It makes me sad inside, but sweet tea for the beverage. And then if it's like alcohol beverage, I love Belgian beer. Mm. Oh my god, I love Belgian beer. And then uh, probably a scotch like Macallan Twelve Year whiskey. Are you a coffee guy? I'm more of a tea yeah, guy. Tea. I can drink coffee, but I, yeah. I don't, you know. It's not like you have it every day. No, definitely not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I have a problem there. Let's move in. We're going to move into the you guys performing, cool. you and your team performing, your band team. My performing, team. <laughs> performing a song. Uh, what song did you decide to play? And then explain a little bit about why, uh, what that song is about. Uh, well, the song we're going to do is Keep Your Life Funky, mostly because this song has a different version of it uh, that we play as a, as a four-piece. And this particular song is basically kind of a, a, a credo for, for people um, that uh, no matter how difficult things might get, that uh, you just have to, like we talked about being disciplined, mm -hmm. you kind of keep your life funky. Like if you're going to make it, you've got to really push and, and drive yourself. And uh, it doesn't, I, I kind of like to write songs that a little bit are, have a veil over it. So the lyrics don't obviously come out and say, you know, be true to yourself a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, like I try to hint at that 
Um, but then I try to disguise it at the same time. So keep your life funky is whatever kind of adversity it is. You you almost have to like use that that struggle mm-hmm. um, to you know push yourself forward because that's. I mean, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, if people wanted to listen and go find out, you know, connect with you and listen to your music, where where do you send people? Uh, anywhere you download a stream. So you know, iTunes, Spotify. We're on Instagram at Donovan Keith Music on Facebook and uh, DonovanKeithMusic.com. Man, thank you for your time, man. I appreciate it, dude. Uh, thanks for the show, chocolate. <laughs> you got a show tonight, so at the Rustic, and yep. hopefully that goes well. And um, yeah, you you guys can take the chocolate with you. So. Oh, I would. (laughs) I'll try not to eat the whole thing, the whole bar in one sitting.